History of Role Playing Games in 101 Objects, Chapter 2 Rules for Fantastic Medieval War Games. That title comes from uh, the subtitle of the original Dungeons and Dragons box, which I have here. And you see, it says Dungeons and Dragons, Rules for Fantastic Medieval War Games, uh, which sort of makes the point that nobody's talking about this as, as a role playing game at this point. Uh, this is a set of war games rules. It's obviously a very different set of war games rules to anything that come before, um, but at this point, Dungeons and Dragons in its original form was a war game. It was marketed to war gamers, and okay, the fact that you controlled one character each, and that made it different from let's say people playing Avalon Hills Gettysburg or whatever. Um, yes, very very different, but its target demographic was people who already played war games. And that's a pretty small niche, even then. So let's have a look. Let's have a look at the events that came to came together to to get to this stage, to get to this original Dungeons and Dragons box set. Uh, as we saw in in Chapter One, Arneson and Gygax had uh, collaborated to, to produce the rules. Uh, there is some debate about who did how much, but it seems um, putting. Putting the, the, the pieces together, it seems fairly obvious to me that um, Arneson had the original idea, but perhaps didn't do that much with it after that. Certainly not enough to get it into a state that could be published and sold and taught or you know used by people who had not been taught personally by the, uh, the originators of the game. It was Gygax who essentially puts Arneson's handwritten manuscripts together into a publishable form. He essentially edited the game, even if it was, uh, the fantasy world was, and the fantasy rules were largely Arneson's idea. Part of the reason for that, apparently, is that Arneson absolutely could not type. He was he was terrible at it. He handwrote everything. And in fact, most of the rules, probably for Blackmore, were, were up here in Arneson's head. Uh, that's not a way to sell a game, obviously, so Gygax was the one who typed them all up. Um, also, it's worth pointing out, uh, Arneson didn't have any money to put into publishing the game. Uh, Gygax and Arneson, or certainly Gygax, had, has uh, touted the the, uh, the game to a couple of publishers, uh, Guidon on Games, who'd published Chainmail originally, uh, and depending on who you talk to, Possibly Avalon Hill, possibly not. We don't know that for certain. Uh, but he he got rejections. Guidon Games apparently was was downsizing. They would have been the most obvious partner. And he'd uh, he'd run Dungeons and Dragons at the local convention, Gen Con, Gen like Geneva Wargaming Convention, and uh, it had gone down very well there. And um, this had been noted by a guy called Don Kay, who was a, a friend of Gygax's. And Don Kay suggested to Gygax, why don't we form our own company? Let's publish it ourselves. Uh, and, in fact, Don Kay went so far as to cash in his life insurance policy to pay for this, which is generous. Uh, so they set up Tactical Studies Rules as a partnership. Uh, they still didn't have enough money to publish Dungeons & Dragons as they wanted it to be. So what they did first was published uh, a set of English Civil War miniatures rules called, I think, Cavaliers and Roundheads. The idea was that Cavaliers and Roundheads would make enough money that that money could be ploughed into publishing the first print run of Dungeons & Dragons. Unfortunately, it didn't work out that way. Cavaliers and Roundheads was not successful enough to do that, so they were still short of cash. Luckily, they found another friend... Uh, a guy called Brian Bloom, who did have a bit of money, and uh, his father owned a local factory or something. <coughs> and uh, Brian put in a bit of cash, and he became the third partner of TSR, which is the, the organisation that um, that they'd set up to publish Tactical Studies Rules. If you look at the, uh, the, tactical, the TSR logo on the front, though, interestingly, you'll see that the logo is two letters. It's not TSR. Not at this point, and it's not even GKB or whatever. It's it's GK with the G for for Gygax and the K for Don K. Anyway, they they got enough money to publish Dungeons and Dragons in pretty much this form. This is a third printing. Uh, the first printing looks pretty much the same as this. Some some minor differences. 
uh, and it's it's a, a wood grain cardboard box. And I'll, let's show you what's inside, shall we? Let's show you. What, let's do an unboxing video, if you like. Again, I feel I should put cotton gloves. Wooden box. Uh, you get a set of reference sheets. Or correction sheets, actually. Correction sheet. From what, was, what was wrong in the oops, what was wrong in the first printing, and then uh, okay, sorry about that, and then a set of reference sheets. I suppose this is like a proto dungeon master screen almost. It doesn't really have the screen form, but it has the the uh, a lot of tables that would be relevant for playing the game. And then uh, most importantly. You get three softback booklets. Booklet one, Men and Magic. Volume two, Monsters and Treasure. And volume three, The Underworld and Wilderness Adventures. Now, this is not being this is not being said for the first time. This has been said many times before. The originals are still actually a bit of a mess. They make a lot of assumptions uh, about the sort of people who are going to be playing Dungeons and Dragons. In particular, they assume they are war gamers, and so they assume that people who are playing Dungeons and Dragons for the first time are familiar with some of the basic war gaming concepts, uh, like uh, movement is measured in inches, uh, and in fact continues to be measured in inches for for several versions of the game. Inches simply means you know how far you would move your your miniature, or your character on the tabletop. Uh, it's also it's also worth pointing out. You'll sometimes see old school gamers or people who pretend that they're old school gamers scoff at modern gamers who use miniatures in their Dungeons and Dragons game because apparently that's you know that's something that came in with later editions. Back when I was a lad, we we did theatre of the mind, we pencil and graph paper. We didn't need miniatures, uh, and this is complete nonsense. Uh, you can see you don't need miniatures to play Dungeons and Dragons, but you can see that this is. Rules for fantastic medieval war games campaigns, playable with paper and pencil and miniature figures. You didn't have to use miniature figures to play Dungeons and Dragons, but I think the assumption was, because you were coming over from miniatures war gaming, that you would do. And that's that's just the assumption that Guy Gax and Arneson made. Certainly Blackmore and Greyhawk were played with miniature figures. Very odd miniature figures some of the times, but uh, some of the time because you know. The, the companies like Valparth and Citadel and so on weren't around making fantasy miniatures then. There were very, very few fantasy miniatures available. As we'd seen, Chainmail was largely innovative in being, you know, providing rules for fantasy wargaming. So there was no real demand for fantasy miniatures at this time. Sure, you could get um, medieval knights, say, uh, but probably not much in the way of wizards or orcs or dragons. So people in the early days tended to sort of use whatever they could. And in fact, uh, quite famously, a lot of the uh, monsters first used in Dungeons & Dragons uh, that Gygax made up in particular were based on some sort of rubber Chinese toys that he bought in a toy store. Uh, the the Boulette is definitely one of these. The Rust Monster as well um, was, a, was a toy in a bag of rubbery plastic toys that he got cheap in a toy store. It wasn't called a rust monster. It wasn't called a land shark bullet or whatever. Uh, but that's you know the form definitely was that. Let's have a look and see what's in these these three booklets. Uh, Men and Magic, Volume One. Uh, you can see this is the third printing. Incidentally, the first printing, as you might imagine, are the most desirable. Uh, there's about a thousand copies we think of each of each printing. Uh, so they're about as rare as each other, but the uh, the first printing is obviously more desirable because it's the first printing. I think um, the last one one came up for auction not that long ago for and sold for about twenty thousand dollars. So uh, it was in good condition. If you've got a nice condition original D and D box set first printing, um, yeah, about twenty thousand dollars is what you could hope to get if it's if it's that condition. Uh, prices do still seem to be going up, which is good if you if you sell. What I do. Uh, incidentally, if you've got if you've got a wood grain set and you want to, or any old uh, Dungeons and Dragons stuff, and you want to know 
uh, if it's a particular printing or if it's a particularly rare item, then a good website to look at is www.akium.com. A C A U. I've spelled that wrong. I'll, I'll put the link down below. Akium.com is very good, and you can go to their rule books index and their modules index, and the, you'll find out a bit more about different printings and how rare they are and how desirable they are. Uh, although, probably the best way to find out how expensive, uh, how much something is worth, is, is have a look uh, on eBay and see what they're selling for. Sometimes with the rarer ones, it's, it's harder to tell because not that many come up. You know, with um, first printing original D&D box sets, probably only one comes up for auction every couple of years or so. So you, the markets change and um, you, know, you have to assume that, you know, a, a particular one went for a certain price because of, you know, particular condition or because it had particular uh, history, you know, it was owned by somebody famous, etc. Anyway, Volume 1, Men and Magic, by, uh, credited to both Guy Gax and Arneson, and dedicated to all the fantasy war gamers who have enthusiastically played and expanded upon the chainmail fantasy rules. See, Guy Gass maybe clearly stressing that almost that this is a continuation of chainmail. Uh, with thanks, Grassjude, here is something better. Special thanks to the Midwest Military Simulation Association, that's the Minnesota group, the Lake Geneva Tactical Studies Association, that's the Wisconsin group, Rob Kuntz and Tom Keogh in memoriam. I don't know who Tom Keogh is. If you know who Tom Keogh is, please um, mention in the, in the comments below. Rob Kuntz will come to you later. It's in reasonable condition, this copy. Uh, we've got, first thing you notice actually, if you go to character classes, we have three main classes of characters, only three. We've got fighting men. None of this female fighters nonsense. You know, all all fighters are, are male. Fighting men, magic users, and clerics. So no thieves. They come in the first supplement. We'll show you later. Um, tells you a bit about the character classes, a bit about races. Uh, something to note here is this is early enough that uh, Tolkien Enterprises hasn't become aware of Dungeons and Dragons' existence yet. Um, and you can tell that because we've still got mention of hobbits, ants, uh, later on you can see balrogs. Um, it's it's often put around the uh, dungeon that uh, TSR was sued by the Tolkien estate because of the use of hobbits and so on. That's not actually true. They, um, the legal action was taken by Tolkien Enterprises, which is not the estate of the author. It's the company set up to administer the uh, media rights that were acquired from Professor Tolkien in the late 60s. Uh, they're much more aggressive um, you know, and continue to be. And in fact, the Tolkien estate and Tolkien Enterprises subsequently had, had a legal dispute between themselves. Uh, I think over the, the film uh, there was something about gambling machines. Anyway, and, uh, anyway. Uh, and you'll see occasionally Christopher Tolkien, Tolkien's youngest son, a literary executor, will, will complain that they made very little money, if no money, out of the Peter Jackson films. So essentially they're two different organisations. It was Tolkien Enterprises that complained about hobbits and Ents and Balrogs and so on in Dungeons and & Dragons. So in later printings, when we get to the white box printings, um, hobbits are called halflings, as, as they are now. Ents are called treants, as they are now. Balrogs are Balor demons, as they are now. Uh, this takes you through the um, abilities. Strength, intelligence, wisdom, constitution, dexterity, charisma. So they pretty much stayed the same since the beginning. A bit about non-player characters. Equipment. Don't at this point have the wide variety of pole arms that Gary Gygax was such a fan of. Levels, experience points. The idea of you know, progressing through levels is very early. Spells, and you'll recognise a lot of the spells from, from today. So his, his first level magic user spells, detect magic, hold portal, read magic, read languages, protection from evil, light, charm, person, sleep. You know, lots of, um, lots of familiar magic user spells there. With uh, explanations of spells, so this is essentially this is the player's handbook. What we call them, don't get that in later models. Don't get don't get them in later versions. 
clearly you get female magic users even if you don't get female fighters. More spells. First drawing of a monster, it's a hobgoblin. Uh, and you see it was printed by Heritage Models, printed, it was printed by a local um, miniatures maker that did some war games was. Uh, and also some of the things, some of the other games available from TSR at the time. So we've got mention of Cavaliers and Roundheads. Uh, Tricola, the Napoleonic war game in miniature. Warriors of Mars, uh, Warfare Barzim. So that's uh, uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs, John Carter, Mars war game. Uh, Chainmail Still, Tactics, etc. Et so that's book one. Book two, Monsters and Treasure. This one, unfortunately, has come away from the cover. Uh, apparently that's a Nazgul. Again, you don't get Nazgul in later editions because Tolkien Enterprises complain. Uh, here's our list of, first list of monsters. And again, you'll see some pretty familiar looking monsters. Goblins, kobolds, orcs, ogres, giants, ghouls, whites, cockatrices, basilisks, manticorns, dragons, balrogs. I mentioned about Balrogs, we don't get those anymore. Descriptions of various monsters. That is an interesting one for orcs. The number of different tribes of orcs can be varied as desired. You think? Okay. Basing the decision on... I spelled Tolkien's name wrong. I mean, that's probably the sort of thing that's going to annoy people. <laughs> it's spelled Tolkien, T O L K E I N, or Random Chance. You see that spelt wrong so many times. J R R Tolkien. Um, I would suggest you look up um, look up a website, the Tolkien Society, www.tolkein society.org. It's quite a funny website. Uh, ghouls, right? So here's all the, the monster listings. Notice that the um, it's it's fair to say that the artwork is is not hugely professional, and and to be fair, it wasn't. They they for the most part the artists in the original D and D box set uh, were people that Gygax knew. There were there were local gamers as much as anything, or friends of friends. So the uh, but you know they were limited by the printing technology as well. This is clearly a a black and white printing. So. Yeah. So don't expect a sort of full colour Larry Elmore masterpiece. Uh, what else have we got? We've got treasure, obviously. So some of the some of the famous magic items go right back to the beginning. So we've got things like um, potion of levitation, uh, ring of invisibility. I mean, that's probably one of the most obvious magic items in fantasy. Is now ring of invisibility, crystal ball, boots of travelling and leaping. Uh, and then you've got explanations of magic items, the concept of plus one swords and so on, that comes in very early. Snake staff, staff of power, helm of telepathy. That's our first picture of a fire element. I quite like that one, the fire element, it's quite sweet. And the head of a dragon. I, like, I think I much prefer the, the original format of dragon turtle to what you get in later versions where you know the dragon turtle in original is much more dragon and much less turtle and later in later editions it's much more turtle and much less dragon i think i quite prefer this way around so that's that's volume two volume three uh the underworld and wilderness adventures now you'd think this would be the book if if Book one was mostly the player's handbook, and book two seemed to be a mixture of what we'd now think of as the Dungeon Master's Guide and uh, the Monster Manual. You'd think book three would be maybe how to play the game, and it, and it isn't really. In, in fact, arguably, I'd say, you know, original Dungeons & Dragons in this format lacks any advice on how to actually run a campaign, how to actually play the game. That, and that's definitely a drawback. They, they do fix that later in, in later editions, obviously. Um, that's a pretty amateurish dragon, I'd say. I think, you know, there are probably lots of, I'd say, 11 year old artists who can do a better dragon than that, I'm afraid. Uh, they give you a, a sample cross section of levels in your dungeon. 
And, and, and in fact, this, this paragraph of advice, before it is possible to conduct a campaign of adventures in the mazy dungeons, it is necessary for the referee to sit down with pencil in hand and draw these labyrinths on graph paper. Graph paper, people, graph paper. You kids today with your computers, you've never had it. Unquestionably, this will require a great deal of time and effort and imagination. The dungeon should look something like the example given below, with numerous levels which sprawl in all directions, not necessarily stacked neatly above each other in a straight line. So, and clearly, very early on, in fact, in this, in this early form, it's called Dungeons and Dragons, the game, and I think the assumption is that most adventures take place underground in a dungeon. Like, there's no... There's definitely no suggestion at this time um, that role-playing campaigns could be, you know, full of political intrigue or whatever. Um, basically, the idea is you you take your group of characters, possibly with lots and lots of henchmen, that was the thing in those days, take your group of characters down uh, beneath the earth into the dungeon, uh, you kill some monsters, you get some treasure, you fall into traps, uh, you die, you uh, the survivors get out with some treasure, and they level up. Or they gain experience points and eventually level up. We do have a, a sample map. Um, a sample map of underworld level. So I suppose actually this this is probably the first published a dungeon. Uh, it, it's a pretty basic one. Um, and if I hold that up to the camera, you can just about to see them. It's quite, I'd say, poorly drawn again. I suppose a dungeon doesn't have to be particularly well drawn, does it? Well, there's, there's some. <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll read out room five to you because it, it sort of demonstrates just what this is. This is not really a detailed dungeon as we would know them from from later years. Uh, room five, which uh, I think is here. Uh, the combinations here are really vicious, and unless you're out to get your players, it is not suggested for actual use. So why put it in the demonstration then? Passage South D is a slanting corridor which will take them at least one level deeper, and if the slope is gentle, even dwarves won't recognise it. That's quite a, a big thing in early dungeons, actually. This idea that you get slanting passages that you take you on a level deeper, and the reason that that's significant is that if you go one level deeper, all the monsters are harder because it's a level deeper. That, that persists, actually, for many years, that idea that the deeper you go in the dungeon... Just by the nature of it, somehow, I don't know, being closer to the centre of the earth or whatever, the, the, the monsters are harder. All the monsters live in the bottom of the dungeon. Now, I'm not actually sure why that should be, but, but that was accepted as gospel for many, many years. Uh, what else have we got? Oh, you get you more treasure as you go further down as well. Uh, let's see, a monster level table. So this is the, in, the indication of, you know, this is the, the level of the, the dungeon. So one is the first level down from the surface, and you're getting kobolds, goblins, skeletons, orcs, that kind of low-level monster. When you get down to level six, uh, then the monsters are giants. Quite what giants should be living right down at the bottom of a dungeon? I don't know. Uh, giants, hydra, dragons, basculars, basically all these really large monsters. <laughs> Quite what large monsters should live right down in the bottom of a dungeon? I don't know, but that, that was just how it was done. Oh, and 11, evil high priest. Uh, there is, here we go, the first, actually, this is, I suppose, the only thing we get that is how to play a game. This is an uh, example of the referee moderating a dungeon expedition. Uh, and again, I'll, I'll read this out. This is, this is worth, worth me reading it, or at least the first bit of it. The players, equipped and ready are assumed to have located a set of stairs descending to the first level beneath the ground. The referee's part... Notice, by the way, it's called the referee. We don't get the, the term dungeon master until somewhat later. Uh, so, referee at this point. The referee's part will be indicated ref, that of the caller for the players being shown as Cal. Caller. That's something we don't get in Dungeons & Dragons anymore. We've had role-playing games. You know, the idea that you'd have a, uh, a group of players, but only one of them, just one of them, 
would talk to the to the referee or the dungeon master. So the group would essentially would decide what they're going to do as a group, tell the caller, and the caller would pass the instructions on to the dungeon master. In hindsight, that sounds very very strange. I don't I don't know many groups that ever played that way. Um, maybe if you've got like twenty players in a group, and, and there were suggestions that some people in the early days actually did play with very large groups. Uh, then maybe it makes sense, but it doesn't seem like a fun way to, to play role-playing games to me. So, referee uh, steps down to the east. Caller, we're going down. Referee, 10 feet, 20 feet, 30 feet, a 10-foot square landing, steps down to the north and curving down southeast. Caller, take those to the southeast. Referee, 10 foot, and the steps curve more to the south. 20 foot, steps end, and you're on a 10-foot wide passage which runs east, southeast, and west. There is a door to your left across the passage on a northwest wall. Caller, listen at the door, three of us. Ref, balls, three dice. You hear nothing. At this time, a check for wandering monsters is also made. Caller, ignore the door and proceed along the corridor southeastwards. Referee, 10 foot, 20 foot, 30 foot, 40 foot, 50 foot, four way, north, I think he means to cross around. Northwest, northeast, south, and southwest. The south passage is twenty foot wide. This is a lot of you know, measurement because the idea was that you would be mapping this on graph paper as you as you went. Uh, and I know some people still play that way. Some people still play that way. And that's definitely an old school way of playing. Is that you you map things as you go. To be honest, it it doesn't sound actually that much fun. The graph paper mapping. Um, I think I can remember my own first two experiences of playing Dungeons and Dragons, and the first experience was a lot less fun than the second experience. Because the first experience I had, I, you know, I came away thinking Dungeons and Dragons is a game mostly of, <laughs> about mapping things out on graph paper, and you spend most of the, your questions asking the dungeon master, "Okay, was was that uh, passage right on the left? Was that twenty foot down the corridor or thirty foot?" That's not exciting. My second experience of playing Dungeons and Dragons with a completely different dungeon master was much more fun, and I came away thinking Dungeons and Dragons is a game about you know sort of leaping over barricades to sort of the kobold archer who's about to shoot your compatriots who are down to one hit point, and it was exciting. Uh, so I hope you know play Dungeons and Dragons the second way, not the first way. It shouldn't be about tedious mapping, I don't think. Anyway, we won't read through the whole example, but you get the idea. Uh, then there's a bit about the wilderness. Uh, and a really interesting thing about the original Dungeons & Dragons set is it actually recommends the use of a completely different game to do outdoor, outdoor levels. Um, it uses, in fact, a, a game not even made by TSR, but by Avalon Hill called Outdoor Survival, which is a sort of wilderness survival board game that was sort of popular about the time, I mean, popular in, a, in, a, in something of a niche. Uh, it's quite difficult to get hold of nowadays. We've never actually had one in stock in the shop. It's probably on my, my bucket list of things I'd like to stock. Avalon Hill Outdoor Survival. Um, it says, Outdoor Survival has a playing board perfect for general adventures. Catch basins are castles, buildings are towns. Outdoor Survival is a modern wilderness survival game, so to change some of the map features to make it fit in with a fantasy setting. And the balance of the terrain is as indicated. I've, I've never seen anybody um, um, do this, uh, but I'm no doubt, you know, no doubt in the very early days he did. Another interesting spelling mistake here: Gary Gygax spelled the name of his own campaign wrong. So Greyhawk here is spelt G R A Y H A U K H A so H A W K rather than G R E Y. But it does mention uh, Blackmoor. Blackmoor is a village of small size, a one-horse town, uh, while Greyhawk is a large city. Both have maps and streets and buildings indicated, and players can have town adventures roaming around the bazaars. This, essentially, this is Gygax and Arneson talking about their own campaigns, suggesting that as well as creating your dungeons, you might have a, a local settlement for the, the players, ca player characters to withdraw to at the end of adventures. And that was a big part of uh, certainly of Arneson's original campaign. Uh, so we've got, we've got a bit more about wilderness monsters and wilderness movement. Uh, wilderness movement isn't in inches, it's in hexes. Again, that's taken from the outdoor survival board game, which has a hex map. First picture of an efreet or a fruity. I don't know which is the singular and which is the plural out of a fruit and a fruity. 
uh, wandering monster tables for the wilderness. <coughs> Some of the, uh, the the random monsters you encounter uh, above ground are rather tougher than the ones you do, you'd encounter below ground. So um, uh, you could roll, you know, undead comes up quite commonly there. Uh, on the undead table, you get, you know, you can get things like wraiths and mummies and spectres and vampires and they're quite tough monsters just to have wandering around the wilderness. Uh, a bit about construction of castles. Uh, the, I think the, the sort of suggestion was, and, and this continued through, through many years of Dungeons and Dragons, as your characters get more powerful, they sort of start to semi-retire and they'll settle down and build themselves a castle and so on. Uh, and hire specialists and men-at-arms. So this is this is now considered a pretty minor part of the game. Um, you don't really get much about it at all in um, in the standard official rule books for fifth edition or fourth edition or third edition. And it was sort of, sort of something added in supplement. But in the early days, this is important enough that it forms a fairly large part of book three of the original box set. Hiring men at arms. Uh, also, you'd take men at arms, as I mentioned before, you'd take men at arms down the dungeon with you a lot of the time. Um, essentially as cannon fodder. So, you know, you might have, you know, six player characters, but you, each player character would have, like, two henchmen or hirelings in tow, and uh, <laughs> we want to check for traps. <laughs> the thief's unconscious. Oh, we'll send, send three henchmen down the corridor instead. A bit about aerial combat. Uh, written orders. That's something that came from wargaming. It is suggested... Uh, this is for aerial combat. It's suggested that orders be written so that simultaneous movement is possible. Orders need only indicate the direction, length, and altitude gain or loss. Firing missiles is also always allowable at the end of a turn unless the fi unless the firer is meleeed and unable to do so. It is therefore unnecessary to record firing instructions. Uh, which is that's a small paragraph of really quite confusing text, and a lot of a lot of original Dungeons and Dragons is, is I'm afraid is a bit like that. Missile fire movement. Naval combat. Again, that's a fairly obscure part of the game nowadays, but it was important enough that they put rules in the original box set. In fact, you know, naval combat was considered more important. They put rules in rather than having a proper sample dungeon, which you'd have thought would have made more sense. Uh, special suggestions for monsters in naval encounters. Uh, giant octopi, giant squids, giant leeches. Uh, nice picture of elementals. Uh, and it finishes with Fight On! Quite like that. So that that's the original Dungeons & Dragons box set in uh, three volumes. They weren't available separately. You bought, you bought the box set and um, uh, the, you can see the price. Uh, if I can put these away neatly and tidily there. I'll say they weren't available. I don't think they're available individually, but they do have individual prices. So each each booklet is priced at three dollars fifty. I don't know whether the intention was that you could buy separate. I, I wasn't aware that actually that was ever the case. If you know different, please uh, please mention in the comments. Um, the original price, though, I say the same from the, for the first few printings, ten dollars, uh, which was considered quite expensive at the time. Uh, that's that's probably um, if you if you like inflation, it's probably getting on for forty five fifty dollars US dollars today, which is you know is not a cheap game. So that was uh, that's the original Dungeons and Dragons box set. So that was that was our uh, object eight in our one hundred and one objects. By the way, object nine is this is the first published supplement for Dungeons and Dragons, supplement one Greyhawk, uh, which essentially is a rules expansion. Uh, and there's a few of these supplements for for original Dungeons Dragons. Again, this one is not coming away from the cover, unfortunately. This is quite old. Um, this is a ninth printing from 1976. Um, oh, the uh, the original Dungeons Dragons box set that came out in um, uh, January 1974. If I'm correct. Uh, Greyhawk followed soon after. Um, Incidentally, that's at our first ever Beholder, which is one of the things introduced the first time ago. Greyhawk's got interesting stuff and introduces... It's not 
essential because it is a supplement. It's an optional supplement, but it, it was, I think it was quickly considered uh, essential. It was written by Gygax and, uh, and Rob Kuntz. Uh, uh, Kuntz is an interesting, uh, interesting character. He was, a, he was essentially, I'd say he was a friend of Gygax's and the Gygax family, probably rather more than that. He'd had a, a sort of tough upbringing and I think ended up um, living on, living on his own or the oldest person in his household from really quite a very young age. And the Gygax family sort of not quite adopted him, but they sort of took him under their wing a little bit, particularly Gary. And um, he's probably rather closer than a family friend and they sort of looked after him. Uh, and naturally Rob Kuntz became uh, something of a gamer. Uh, and in fact, in Gary's uh, Greyhawk campaign, when, Gar when Gary wanted to take a break from DMing, refereeing, I suppose I should say, um, often it was Rob who was the DM. Uh, uh, Rob has uh, uh, certainly helped to develop Greyhawk as the setting. Um, he had his own characters in the campaign. I think um, Rary was uh, was his was his magic user character uh, and also Robble R the fighter uh, this allowed Gary to Gary Gygax to play his own characters and Morden Kynan was probably his most famous character in that campaign and you can see Morden Kynan's sword and Morden Kynan's faithful hound and uh, Rary's mnemonic enhancer all named after these original characters in the, in the Greyhawk campaign what else is in supplement one um, nice art for Lizard Man. Uh, that actually became the TSR logo. So, there we go. There's a new TSR logo, rather nicer than the GK. And also, I suppose, I, I imagine Brian Bloom said, well, how come, how come my news sure isn't in the, in the logo? Uh, you also get... There's a bit more about... Well, a bit more about different characters already and different races. Um, but we've got the first mention of Thieves. Thieves came in in Supplement 1. I always thought that was a little bit strange that um, of the original three character classes that Cleric was one of the original character classes but not Thieves because if you think about it in fantasy literature um, the Thief is a, is a far more common character in fantasy literature than than the Cleric. You know, Bilbo in The Hobbit is a Thief, Kugel in the Dying Earth books. Uh, you could make the case that Conan, although he's obviously very, very strong and good at fighting, actually a lot of what he does is thiefy kind of stuff. Whereas a few, rather fewer clerics in fantasy literature. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so anyway, the, the uh, that's that's the first appearance of the of the cleric. Uh, sorry, of, of the thief. A bit more new rules. The idea of um, so we've got all the things for the thieves, all the all the skills and so on. There's an alternative combat system. Some new monsters. I'd mentioned before that this is the this is where the Beholder appears the first time. New spells. I think actually, is this where Magic Missile appears the first time? I'm afraid of feeling it is. Yeah, Magic Missile appears the first time in uh, in Greyhawk. More magic items. So basically, it's it's just extra stuff for your game. And probably the, the, the thing that most people really went for was the Thief character class. Uh, so that was up. That was object uh, number nine. Object number ten is is the second supplement. Uh, and whereas that was that was Gygax's Greyhawk, this is Arneson's Blackmore. And you see it's credited to Dave Arneson. It has a wonderful picture of Castle Blackmore on the front. And again, this is much of the same thing. I, I got the impression that um, Blackmore was considered less essential than Greyhawk. Um, if you look, for example, at character classes, you know, Greyhawk introduces the um, the thief character class, uh, whereas Blackmore introduces the monk and the assassin. And, you know, they're, let's be honest, they're less essential character classes than the thief. But it's the usual it's it's the usual kind of stuff that we saw in Greyhawk for the most part: new monsters, uh, new some new spells, and so on. One thing that we do have is a proper sample dungeon for the first time. Uh, page 28, and it's called, wonderfully, the Temple of the Frog. Instantly, that always makes me think of Rainbow, you know, the, the rock band Rainbow, because there's a song by Rainbow called Temple of the King, and of course Rainbow's lead guitarist is Richie Blackmore. So <laughs> the combination of Blackmore and Temple of the makes me think of that song. If you don't know the song, it's a good song. Look it up. 
Temple of the King. Anyway, here we go. We've got a uh, published dungeon. We've got an actual pages of background about the dungeon. That's unusual. It's the first time we've had that. Uh, there's our dungeon map. Quite an elaborate dungeon map. Again, sort of just copied off the graph paper, pretty much. Uh, with quite detailed room descriptions. Um, let's, let's give you a room description. The High Priest of the Temple of the Fog. Um, his magic rings. Uh, sort of how the magic rings work. It's quite elaborate. You know, this is this is a proper dungeon adventure, and this is the first time. This is the first time that TSR had published a dungeon adventure. It's not actually the first time anybody had published a dungeon adventure. There's, there's a there's a Oh, I forget the name of the company, but um, Palace of the Vampire Queen was published by a third party. And I think that would take the record for the earliest published adventure for Dungeons & Dragons. But this is the first one that TSR had done. And you know, it's, it's quite a lot of stuff here. Uh, we've also got a bit about underwater adventures for the first time. bit about disease. So bits and pieces and a few blank pages at the end. So that was uh, that was Object 10, Dungeon, uh, Blackwall. There's a few other supplements to the original Dungeons and Dragons, uh, things like Eldritch Wizardry, uh, Gods, Demigods and Heroes, which was um, essentially a list of gods, what, essentially what became deities and demigods or legends and lore in later editions. Uh, swords and Spells, I think that's it. Am I missing one? No, I think that's it. But also the, at this time, you're starting to see third-party companies, other companies, publishing stuff for Dungeons & Dragons. Um, it mentioned Palace of the Vampire Queen. Or was, that's still a bit... That's quite rare to find. It's quite unusual. It, it didn't sell in large numbers. Um, but a much more successful company was uh, called Judges Guild. Uh, and they produced quite a lot of stuff. Um, produced some adventures. We'll come to one of those shortly. But... Uh, Object 11, I'm going to show you now, is whatever package it is called City State of the Invincible Overlord. And this is a, a first printing of City State of the Invincible Overlord, and it's really quite a, an impressive package. There's the cover page, and you get. This, this has been sort of covered in uh, protective plastic, which it, collectors won't like, but it must have, it has, has helped it to survive the however many years since the mid-70s. So you get, you get a bunch of these maps. Really quite, this is a luxury product. This is probably the first luxury product. You get these really lovely big maps, um, and it's, you know, Detailed descriptions. Actually, I'll show you this. This one's really good. Really good map. Detailed descriptions of a city. Look at that! Isn't that fantastic? Well, you, if you got that in a in a role playing product today, you'd be quite happy with that. I think you know this is a really nice quality map. Fantastic at the time. You know, you think that we're coming from you know those three books and the, those three booklets in a in a really Naff, naff cardboard box that to, to this is really quite quite impressive and then there's a booklet um which have got sort of in people you might encounter in the city so when you know in original Dungeons and Dragons where it said you might want to detail your own city and you might be thinking well that's going to take ages you'd buy City State of the Invincible Overlord and there are other products um here's, here's the guide to the city state that comes with it and you know you've even got you know here's here's the gateway is the gatekeeper, Mr. Thinway Abbon. He's a lawful good fighter. Uh, Thinway is entrusted, spell wrong, is entrusted, <laughs> entrusted with a companion key, 150 gold pieces to the north gate, four dwarves, Bobar, Burkle, Bomash, and Bungri, and it gives you stats for those. Uh, I don't know how much money they've got locked. <laughs> Always you get in these early days, you get how much coins they've got locked away in, in chests because it's sort of assumed that people are going to, you know, player characters are going to want to nick stuff off them. And if you've ever seen people playing things like Baldur's Gate on PC, and, and I guess that's a reasonable assumption, characters do wander around, you know, nicking stuff. So that's City State of the Invincible Overlord, and that was a, you know, 
It's described on the front as a huge referee's aid, and I think, to be fair, it is. Uh, you know, nothing like this had come along before, and to be honest, nothing like this came along for quite some time afterwards. It's a, it's a hugely important supplement, uh, because it's it's the first, arguably, this is the first detailed campaign setter. And they expanded it. Um, there were all the uh, Judges Guild adventures that set in the same world. Uh, there's a um, sort of Wilderlands follow up called. Um, oh dear, what's the Wilderlands called? Uh, Wilderlands of High Fantasy, I think it's called. Which comes later. So that was, uh, that was number 11, object number 11. Object number 12 from the same company, Judges Guild. Uh, it's just going to show you as an example of one of their adventures. They do really good adventures. Mostly, you know, mostly straightforward dungeon adventures, but good dungeon adventures. Uh, their reputation for... Th they also did stuff for other games like Traveller. The rep reputation on the Traveller community... Well, not the Traveller community. The, the Traveller role-playing game community, not, not the Traveller community. The reputation on the Traveller RPG community is that their stuff is actually that, that good. And for the D&D stuff, it was very, regardless, it's very good. Uh, here's one of their most famous early adventures, Tegel Manor. Nothing to do with Tegel Airport in Berlin, I don't think. Uh, and it, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty decent dungeon. Not much in the way of room descriptions, um, you know. So room H thirteen, uh, twenty three feet by forty feet by twenty feet, uh, dusty, closed in smell, large organ room, and graceful harp, harmonise in concerto of erratic music. Organ has 42 ivory keys worth 10 gold pieces. <laughs> which is, which nowadays would seem like an odd description of a, of a room in a dungeon, but I suppose, you know, it's the basics, you can work from there. And then you get, you know, a decent map of the, of the surroundings. Uh, and actually really quite a decent, uh, really quite a nice map of, of the manor itself. Not half of it. So that's Tegel Manor, and there's, there's quite a. They did a lot. They were quite prolific publishers. Uh, Judges Guild. At a time when TSR weren't, so TSR never produced in the early days many adventures. That came later. Um, and part of the reason for that was that Gary Gygax thought people wouldn't want them. He thought that you know the part of the fun of playing Dungeons and Dragons would be creating your own dungeon. Um, really didn't think that people would want commercial want to buy commercially published dungeons. He was clearly very wrong. Uh, our final object this chapter, um, just just one more, is um, I've here it's one of the other um, companies um, doing it. Well, a guy called Dave Hargrave. Uh, produced some essentially rules expansions for Dungeons and Dragons. Well, sort of for for Dungeons and Dragons, the rules expansions that he came up with in what was called the Arduin Grimoire series are so extensive that arguably it became a different game. But they're sort of marketed as extensions of Dungeons and Dragons, even if not officially. Uh, this is this is volume two of the Arduin Grimoire. Welcome to Skull Tower, um, and as well as rule expansions like new spells and so on. It it's got. Um, critical hit table. I think that's the first critical hits system for Dungeons and Dragons. Gygax hated critical hits as a as a, as a system. Martial artist as character types. There's all sorts of extra news. A new character class, the Saint. Do, 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 no, not that kind of Saint. It's I've I've seen Arden Grimoire stuff described as a bit gonzo. It's a bit weird, it's a bit out there. Um some people liked it, some people didn't. Um but probably it's, it's, it's where you first get the idea that Dungeons & Dragons can be played in many different ways. Uh, at the time, you know, the, the idea is that many, many um, campaigns would be very, what we would now refer to as homebrew. You know, people, people running their own dungeons came up with their own rules, created their own character classes. Um, people seem to be much more reluctant to do that now, or you'll see people screaming about, oh, what about the game balance? Um, uh, and you also see people who are dedicated to playing raw rules as written. I don't think there was concept of rules as written back then. It was just assumed that people would make up rules for stuff as they went along. I think I prefer that idea. Anyway, I think that's the end of uh, chapter two. Uh, in chapter three, will be um, which is called competition. 
we'll be looking at new role-playing games. Rivals to Dungeons and Dragons, the earliest rivals to Dungeons and Dragons. But until then, goodbye, and hope you enjoyed chapter two.